finally met Virtual Traveller, and welcome back to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that explores folklore and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson, and I am an author and professional storyteller. Today, I'm looking at the folklore behind historical tyrants. The story from law for this episode is my original tale of the wily fox, Lovemore Flynn. Here in the UK, the subject of murder throughout history has often preoccupied the nation. This has taken many forms, folk tales, ballads, TV and film. And in fact, when I first started as a writer, I was writing murder mysteries in the form of a series called the Blake Hetherington Mysteries, which I was self-publishing. You can still find these seven mysteries on Amazon if you're interested. The books I wrote fit into the cosy crime genre, and we enjoy these as shows such as Midsummer Murders or the novels of Agatha Christie. These are thought to have come about due to the post-war puzzle-solving craze, but these tales existed long before this. Before I begin to take a look at the gruesome tales of our ancestors, I think it's important to say that these stories are obviously not examples of the right or just behaviour, and so should be listened to in the cultural context they are meant. These tales serve as dire warnings and as lessons of our past, lessons which are embedded into our culture today. In fact, the eponymous story of Bluebeard, a story I will look in more detail at in a moment, has resulted in the name Bluebeard still being used as a way to refer to the modern-day serial killer. So what folklore and stories will I be looking at today for this huge subject? Well, the first story I'm going to look at is the aforementioned Bluebeard, one of the most famous stories of a murderous husband. Bluebeard was originally collected by Charles Perrault. And the story is also echoed in the Grimm Brothers story, Fitch's Bird. Elements of the robber bridegroom, also from the Grimm's, and Mr Fox, collected by Joseph Jacobs, also exist within this tale. And I'll be telling that in the second half of the show, which you will be able to find over on my Patreon. What all these stories have in common, though, are they the story of a daughter who is forced to marry a man with a dark history. In the case of Bluebeard, not long after she is married, she is left in Bluebeard's castle with a set of keys. She is then told that she may go wherever she wishes except one room. Well, of course, who would not become curious about this? And when she does finally let her curiosity get the better of her, well, she discovers a room full of the headless bodies of Bluebeard's previous wives. Her deception is uncovered when her husband returns and finds the key to the barred door has blood on it. And the blood cannot be removed. He is about to send her to the same fate as his previous wives when the girl asks if she may go and pray. Instead of praying, she goes to the top of the castle and calls out for her brothers, who then come and rescue her. The endings for this story vary, and ironically, in the Grimm's version, the wife saves herself. However, in Angela Carter's version, The Bloody Chamber, the wife is rescued by her pistol-touting mother. So, who do we think this Bluebeard figure may actually represent? Well, some think it may be Henry VIII. He had six wives after all, some of which he beheaded. He was also a tyrant, as much of history stands testimony to. But there is someone much further back in history, and far worse in their deeds, whom this story is thought to relate to and his name is Connemore the Cursed. A ruler of Brittany in 540 AD, Connemore was well known for his cruelty. He lived in a fortress on the banks of the River Blavet, which, before a dam was built, was a raging and thunderous torrent. It was said that up until about 150 years ago that this fortress was so feared that anyone who walked by it made the sign of a cross as they did. This was a time when warlords squabbled and the land was still covered with thick forest. But this folkloric figure's deeds were so heinous that his reputation is thought to have entered the records in the form of stories. This figure has endured the test of time. 1,500 years. He was rumoured to be a werewolf and even a spectral ferryman crossing the Breton River. But most famously, he was thought to be the man that inspired the tale of Bluebeard as collected by Charles Perrault. Alain Bouchard published his Grande Chroniques de Bretagne and in it associated Connemore with wife-killing and suggests that 
Because the Breton Count had been warned by a soothsayer that he would meet his death at his own child's hand, he was then in the habit of disposing each of his spouses as soon as she revealed she was pregnant. The story of Bluebeard and his bloody chamber is indeed a dark one, and it's one that has fascinated many for many years. The symbolism within it, the characters and their motivation, and of course the historical theories behind this story, all make it extremely intriguing. So it's not surprising that I've created my own version of this story. The story I'm about to tell you is called Love More Flynn, and is most definitely a Bluebeard tale. Lovemore Flynn is a fine-looking fox. He is always well-groomed and there is not a hair out of place. At the end of his long, distinguished nose is a pince-nez with a tortoiseshell frame. He sculpts the bright white fur of his jowls into points and he makes a horseshoe moustache from it. It's fair to say that he's a very handsome fellow. Lovemore is a late riser, a man of leisure, on nightly prowls, he wears a fine grey coat and melts into the half-light of the evening. With an air of infinite superiority, he stalks the fields and hedgerows, where smaller creatures cower. But this has not always been the case. There was a time when Lovemore had shown compassion for his smaller neighbours. Now, with many acquaintances and few friends, Lovemore is a solitary man. In the neighbouring fields lives the colonel, an old badger, with a set to run. It is an unspoken rule that Lovemore does not interfere with the colonel's day-to-day -day business. Because, you see, Lovemore, Lovemore is trouble. A gentleman, yes, but trouble, nevertheless. And for many years this has been so. Neither has bothered the other, until, that is, one fateful day last spring. Lovemore was courting a rabbit named Mariana. Not a particularly unusual start to the season. The silver-tongued fox, despite his reputation, had absolutely no trouble with the ladies and had many admirers. Mariana was not the first rabbit to fall for Lovemore's charms. But with her beautiful doe eyes and perfect pelt, Mariana too was difficult to resist. Surely she could not possibly have been taken in by the fine words and luxurious manner of Love More Flynn. After what appeared to the neighbouring animals to be a whirlwind romance, the couple were married. Mariana lived in the lap of luxury in Love More's capacious den, but she often missed the comfort found in her many siblings and snuck out during her husband's absences to visit them. Mariana's mother was a renowned cook, and the other rabbits would often visit to feast on her grass seed muffins and dandelion stews. Mariana herself had been taught the art of these delights, but Lovemore forbade her to cook or to even enter their larder. Each night when he came home from his evening's business, he would go to the larder, select the finest ingredients and cook Mariana the most beautiful pies. He was an exceptional cook, but despite the lengths Lovemore went to, Mariana still missed the art. On her visit to the Warren, she would speak of this to her mother. In turn, her mother would counsel her on the authority of men, and she encouraged her not to go against Lovemore's wishes and to think herself lucky to have such a devoted husband. It soon became known amongst the hedgerows that Mariana was not allowed to follow the family tradition of haute cuisine and that she pined for her mother's dandelion stew. And so it was no surprise to anyone but Mariana that... On her way back to the den one night, a magpie stopped her. Mariana! cackled the magpie. Why do you bow to your husband so? Startled, for it was a dark night and he was a dark bird, Mariana stopped in her tracks and thought a while. Well, I love him dearly, magpie, and this is his only wish, and so I must respect it. The magpie let out another cackle. But have you not seen in the larder? I'm forbidden, Mariana replied, a small tear appearing in the corner of her beautiful doe eye. The magpie hopped a little closer. I have the key, Mariana. Would you like it? 
Now, Mariana knew that magpies loved shiny things and knew he must speak the truth. And she did very much long to see inside the larder, to smell the herbs and the spices once again. The magpie saw the longing in Mariana's eyes. You can have it if you want. I have many keys. I shall not miss this one. I must not, Mariana replied. Here's my husband and I must respect his wishes. Very well, Mariana. But you should look more closely at the coat he wears. Perhaps then you will want the key. The magpie flew away into the tree high above her and Mariana ran on home. She was concerned with getting back before her husband did. And she forgot what the magpie had said. That is until Lovemore returned. Good evening, my darling, Lovemore announced on his arrival. And as he spoke, he removed the grey hunting cloak and placed it on the end of their oak bed. It was then that Mariana remembered what the magpie had said. She smiled and kissed him on the cheek and he went off to cook dinner. He went straight to the larder, and as he did, Mariana touched the coat that was on the back of the chair. The comfort she found in its familiar feel and smell had always puzzled her, and yet she had never troubled to ask her husband where it had come from. As she stroked the fabric, she noticed it was larger than the last time she'd seen it, longer in length. She pushed the magpie's cackling to the back of her head. Notoriously cruel birds, she knew this one was no different a troublemaker sent to spoil her peace. And she sat down to dinner with her husband and thought no more of it. A week later, she saw the magpie again. This time he was waiting for her by the old chestnut tree. She pretended not to see him and hurried on past the tree. Marianna, squawked the magpie after her, did you look at the coat? She hopped on, hoping he would just fly away. Don't you want to know what's in those lovely pies he cooks for you? The magpie goaded. She did. She did very much. And so she stopped and turned back towards the tree. I thought so, he crooned. I will have the key, magpie, but you must not tell my husband. He will surely beat me and then he will find you, she replied. I would not do that, Marianna. I value my tail feathers. The magpie cackled and he handed her the key. It shone in the moonlight, winking at them slyly. She tucked it behind her ear and hurried home. she just about had time before her fox came home. Opening the door of the den, she called for her husband, Love more! But there was no early return as she feared. There was no reply. She walked over to the larder pausing outside the door. She knew that once she put the key in the lock, there was no going back. But she had dreamt of cooking for months, and now she yearned for the smell of the garlic and the onion frying in the pan, and it couldn't do any harm, surely, and wouldn't it be amazing if she could cook a dish for Lovemore and it would be on the table for when he got home, and would he not be so grateful he could surely not be angry with her for that? She took the key from behind her ear and placed it in the lock. A reassuring clunk told her that the magpie had not lied. This was the correct key. She pushed the heavy door and peered inside. The smell that hit her was intoxicating and instinctively she leaned back and closed the door again quickly. But she had to look. She wanted to know what it was that Lovemore was using to cook with. It did not smell as the delicious meals tasted. Closing her eyes, she pushed the door wide open in one quick movement and she opened her eyes again. Terror gripped Mariana as her gaze fell upon the contents. From floor to ceiling was a mass of tiny, grey, lifeless bodies. And now, now she recognised the smell. Slamming the door shut, she locked it behind her. A sick feeling began to rise in her stomach and she wished with all her heart that she'd never listened to that magpie. How could Lovemore do this? Now what would become of her? Marianne looked at the clock. She should still have time before Lovemore returned. And a plan started to form in her head. He must not find out. She had to get away. 
but she couldn't leave immediately because he would come home and expect her to be there and he'd know what had happened. No, she needed a proper head start. And she couldn't run to the safety of her mother's. That would endanger the whole Warren. So she needed to get far, far away and quickly. She dove under the bed and started to dig a hole. On his way home from his nightly jaunt, Lovemore's thoughts turned to his wife and how content he was with his life. His coat ruffled in the wind and he drew it a little closer. His creation was almost long enough to keep the elements out completely, but it was taking him a little bit longer to complete. He was painfully aware of the precious nature of his marriage and the fine line he trod every night. She was a good woman and he was very much in love with her, but a fox couldn't change his ways forever. Since marrying Mariana, he'd had to hunt in a different area. After all, she might notice her relatives disappearing, but losses from other Warrens, well, they might be noticed, but they wouldn't be traced back to him. She would surely leave him if she knew, and he could not let that happen. Lovemore! came a bellow, interrupting his thoughts. Lovemore stood stock still. It was a familiar voice coming from the velvety black night. Colonel, Lovemore replied, and, and how are you this fine night? Disturbed, Lovemore, disturbed, and I don't like to be disturbed. I thought we had an agreement, the colonel barked. But we do, colonel. Now tell me, what's troubling you? You're digging, sir. It is impinging on my set and I can't have it, I tell you. Digging, colonel? I assure you, I have not been digging. Then who has been digging for the last hour because someone is and there's loose earth in the east tunnel and someone has taken my valerian root chandelier? It's not me, Colonel. But if anybody has been rearranging my den, I'll be sure to find out who it is and give them a piece of my mind. Very well, you see to it then. Because I cannot have disturbances, Lovemore. I simply will not tolerate it. With that... The colonel disappeared into the night, with only a slight snuffle as he went. Lovemore drew his coat tighter again and continued on his way home. He was really confused. It couldn't be Marianna. She knew not to dig in that direction, surely. Back at the den, Marianna became aware of the time, and she knew her husband would be home very soon. She'd managed to dig out the valerian root that she needed to put in Lovemore's food in order for him to sleep so that she could get away into the night. She pushed a beech leaf rug into place over the dirt to disguise her work. She had just got the rug in place when the door closed behind Lovemore. Good evening, my darling, called Lovemore as Mariana emerged from the bedroom. Are you hungry, my dear? Shall I cook for us? Now that Mariana knew what was in the larder, she found it hard to muster the enthusiasm for her dinner. But she smiled through her teeth. Of course, dear. As Lovemore passed the bedroom to enter the kitchen, he noticed the rug had been moved. And what have you been doing on this fine night, my dear? He smiled. Oh, oh, you know, just tidying up, replied Mariana. But you know I like things just so. Lovemore slipped past Mariana and into the bedroom. This rug is out of place. But don't you think it looks better there, dear? Mariana proffered, holding her breath as her husband leaned down to tend to the mat. No, I don't came the reply, and as he stood up from pulling back the mat, he felt dirt on his paw. Your standards are slipping, dear, he said. And then he remembered the colonel's complaints, and he took her paws in his, and saw the dirt under her nails. Have you been digging? Mariana was silent. She looked up at her husband, and her eyes grew wide. He reached down to stroke her ears and, as he did, his paw fell upon the key. The next evening, Lovemore Flynn went out as usual. This time, though, his fine grey coat reached to the ground and he had a new glossy black feathered collar. He barked at the new moon, tears filling his eyes, and the animals of the hedgerow cowered once more.
I hope you've enjoyed this episode. You can find an extended version of this episode featuring a look at some of the collectors of these gruesome tales, Charles Perrault, the Grimm Brothers and Joseph Jacobs, and my retelling of Joseph Jacobs' Mr Fox across on my Patreon, Rewild Yourself Through Story. Just search for DD Storyteller and there you will find digital zines, audio stories and extended versions of this podcast. I do hope to see you there as I'd love to tell you another story. Thank you to all my patrons for continuing to help my stories reach new ears. And as always, please consider leaving me a review as reviews help these stories to journey out into the world and reach new audiences. You may notice that season one's shows are being released weekly. And that's because these shows were originally aired as live stream shows earlier this year. And I've now converted them to audio for the purposes of the podcast. Season two will be launched in the new year and the episodes will then be released monthly. For more stories woven with folklore in the old ways, you can also find me on Facebook as DD Storyteller and on Instagram as at DD underscore Storyteller. I also have a Facebook group called Stories from Law and there we share folklore and music and books and chat a little about the podcast. Thank you for listening and I'll see you again soon for more Stories from Law. Toodle pip! <laughs> <laughs>